So my research um, looked at the limology of Silver Lake. Um, so I'm Luke Miller, and I'd like to give a thanks to my supervisor, Robin Hyde. And I would also like to thank uh, Jake Coleman and Tyler Roberts uh, for their previous research, the Great Salt Lake Institute for providing funding, uh, the US Forest Service um, for providing resources and information, um, and the Cottonwood Canyon Foundation for providing me an area for to go do my research and also um, Utah Water Watch as well for providing resources. So, um, Silver Lake is up to Cottonwood for those of you who know where that is. Um, so that area is a watershed. So essentially what a watershed is, is it is all the land mass that directs water that we then use for drinking. And so this particular watershed um, provides 30% of the drinking water to Salt Lake. Um, so it's really important that we keep the water coming from this um, watershed healthy and so a lot of conditions need to be monitored at this lake um, and these conditions are monitored using chemical probes and microscopes and we want to look at the clarity the acris and the concentrations of certain chemicals um, and then we take this information and we compare it to previous years because what we know about lakes is that they all have very specific uh, biology and chemistry and physical features. And so it's very hard to understand exactly what is going on at a lake with only a year's worth of data. And it's a lot more, um, it's a lot more, it's a lot better if you have multiple years so that you can see like what is changing and what affects what. Um, so, um, why do we care about lakes? So lakes provide a habitat to many animals, which helps increase um, biodiversity. Another thing is, is so as part of the watershed, lakes kind of act like a bowl with a strainer in the bowl. And what the bowl does is it holds water. And what the strainer does is that it filters and store nutrients. Um, and so if you have a healthy lake, then you also will have healthy runoff. Um, and the lake helps to provide in, uh, groundwater and it hydrates the area, which helps a lot of plants. Um, it helps minimize the damage caused from floods because lakes can help like store and hold a lot of the water. Um, lakes are our best sources of fresh water. Um, they provide resources and nutrients for wildlife. And then also the lake is there for our enjoyment. And so people at Silver Lake like to fish there um, they go camping in the area, there's hiking, there's taking photos, and then just enjoying the scenery. Um, and lakes are definitely essential to ecosystems and the environment. And so in order to uh, protect all these things and keep them, uh, we want to understand our lake and how we can protect it. So as a little bit of background information, um, some things that can hurt the lake is, so fertilizers put in the area, um, fertilizers contain high concentrations of phosphorus and um, nitrate, which um, is great for helping plants grow, but if it um, gets into the rivers, it can carry those nutrients into the lake. Um, and I'll explain that in a second. Uh, so the burning of coal actually uh, puts mercury into the air, which can then absorb into the water. And when it gets into the water, it gets converted into methyl mercury which fish then eat, and then you're eating fish with mercury in them. Uh, similar to fertilizers, um, excess sediments, and these can get released in a lot of ways, uh, whether it be like construction or people just dumping things into the river. Um, this also brings a lot of nutrients into the lake. Um, emissions, um, just from all of our burning, uh, can get oil into the lake, put grease in the lake, and get floatables in the lake as well which can reduce the clarity and put toxic chemicals in the lake. Um, and so a lot of these things, what they can lead to is what's called an algal bloom or eutrophication of the lake. And an algal bloom happens essentially when too many nutrients end up in the lake and it causes, um, it essentially fertilizes the algae and the algae then grows too much and oxygen consuming That's bacteria, excuse me? All right. Oh, okay. And oxygen uh, consuming bacteria then eat this algae. And what this does is, is it causes, it depletes the oxygen in the lake because 
now the bacteria are using up all the oxygen and the lake doesn't have any oxygen for the fish, so fish and animals can't breathe there super well. It reduces the clarity. Um, certain algae can be toxic and release uh, neurotoxins, and it creates, it competes for the resources. Um, so this is why we also want to look at a lot of our concentrations of chemicals and our dissolved oxygen and our algae concentrations to monitor a lot of these things. And so the methods used, um, we use a lot of instruments standard to the fields of chemistry and biology. Um, and so to create a map of the lake, we use sonar mapping. Um, to measure the chlorophyll, a sample of water was put through a glass filter and the chlorophyll was then absorbed into ethanol, which we then could measure the concentration of chlorophyll using spectroscopy. Uh, the dissolved oxygen, temperature, and other chemicals were monitored using probes. Um, the zooplankton from the lake were captured using a zooplankton net that essentially just filters out the water and keeps the zooplankton. Uh, Utah Water Watch uh, sent us an E. coli testing kit, and this kit you basically just grow an E. coli colony, and you're able to count like how many E. coli col colonies grow from a, cert from a certain amount of water. Um, the water speed was measured using a probe. This is just so like we can understand if there are like some underwater currents, how much water is coming in, how much water is coming out. And then the clarity of the lake was looked at uh, using Secchi depths. Um, and so this was the result of the sonar mapping of the lake. And so this is so we can kind of understand the depth of the lake. Um, if I actually go back three slides, I'd like to show that um, in the lake, we've monitored four areas of interest, which are these four labeled sites here. Um, and so to give a scale of the lake about, if you look at the lake about lengthwise, the longest it is is about a thousand feet in length. Um, and the max depth found on this date was 4.2 meters, which is that kind of yellow area right there. And the lake actually had perfect clarity. So um, the Secchi depths, which is pictured right below there, um, essentially you lower that into the water and you just lower it until you can no longer distinguish between the black and the white areas in the Secchi depth. And when I did Secchi depths, I could almost always see the, the, um, the Secchi at the bottom of the lake. Um, so chlorophyll A concentrations. So here were chlorophyll A concentrations. Um, and so we can see like the chlorophyll A can like vary a lot from date to date, but we overall can kind of see a trend of like where our chlorophyll was at for the year. Here was all our dissolved oxygen. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, normally you think that dissolved oxygen would be highest at the surface just because we know that um, as the temperature of water increases, the solubility of uh, gases decreases in liquids. But um, there are like air pockets at the bottom of the lake that slowly release oxygen. And so it's not uncommon to measure a high dissolved oxygen deeper in the lake. Um, and here is the temperature of the lake throughout the year. Um, and so some of our other results um, is these were some of the chemical concentrations we've seen. And this is one of my favorite chemical, the favorite photos I took at the lake. I believe this moose's name is Joe, but I'm not sure. But I was very close to Joe that day. Um, and so we measure a lot of these chem chemical concentrations and looked at the pH. Uh, the water almost doesn't move at the lake at all anywhere unless it's like really windy, but it never gets too windy. Um, and then here, so here is a picture of us using the microscope to monitor the zooplankton. So this is literally, you filter a sample and you empty it onto a Petri dish and you sit there for an hour to two hours just counting every single zooplankton. So pictured here are some Daphnia and pretty much in any sample I would take, it would be 90% Daphnia. And we can see that the zooplankton count increases throughout the summer. Um, and then the E. coli test was done. And the E. coli test um, in August yielded 43 spots. In September, yielded 50 spots. And that's just 50 different E. coli colonies you can see. 
Um, and so if we look at our chlorophyll A analysis, um, the average chlorophyll A throughout the year was about uh, 0.288 parts per billion. Um, what this tells us is that the lake is allotrophic, um, and this is what we expected to see for the lake. Um, and so the range of allotrophic to hypereutrophic essentially says like how um, efficient is the lake at producing um, algae and like what level of algae does it like to reside at. And so this is very low on the scale. Um, this is below 0.5, so this is definitely an allotrophic lake. Um, and so looking at this, um, this analysis tells us that this lake is healthy. Uh, allotropic lakes, generally you want to see a high dissolved oxygen, which is what we saw. It was almost always above 70%, and a lot of times it was about above 100%. Um, there was very clear waters. We could always see the secchi dip through, secchi disk through the lake. Um, there was low production of zooplankton, low production of algae, uh, low nitrogen levels, which was good as well, and cold waters. So, any questions? Thanks very much. Yeah, we can clap. I don't know when to clap before or after. It's we're new in the Zoom thing. It's clapping now. Yeah. Um, that's that's really great, Luke. Um, how fun to think upstream in our watershed. Since we were talking about the lake before, uh, the other lake at the other end of the watershed. Um, I'd love to invite some questions for Luke. Um, I have one. What was the most surprising um, either data point or analysis that you had? Um, that is a um, good question. I would honestly say that the most surprising was, um, so if you look at like the dissolved oxygen, like site one, the dissolved oxygen at two meters deep was definitely like for the first part of the year it was almost always um, like higher than the dissolved oxygen at the surface or at um, one meter deep. Um, and this was like contrary to like what I had seen in a lot of people's research. Um, and so this was the most surprising data point for me just like learn about like the underwater pockets and stuff. But besides that, like everything else like wasn't that surprising. Because it's hard, it's hard because you have to understand like when you're doing the lake as well that any data point, like there can be days in which like there it can just randomly be like a high amount of algae or like a high amount of zooplankton or like a certain chemical. And that can be just unique to just like that day or that week. Okay, cool. Thank you. Awesome. We, we have time for questions. More questions? Preston? Hey, Luke. Um, back in the Pleistocene era, I did a study on limnology of Lake George, uh, New York. So I know a little bit about this stuff. And what we found was that the algae growing on the bottom of the lake, because the water is so clear, the sunlight can penetrate that deep, and the algae on the bottom of the lake, literally you could see the oxygen bubbles being released from the algal mat on the bottom of the lake. So you might want to think about that as a possible source of the oxygen. I'm not familiar with Silver Lake, but we certainly observed that in New York. Yeah. I, yeah, okay, I will definitely consider that. Thank you. I think that's one of the reasons it's good that you have um, multiple depths as well, so that you're doing a vertical transect. Yeah, uh, and I think if uh, if I had more time in the research, it definitely would have been interesting to get um, more depths and look at like the algae at each different depth and compare them. Yeah, that's a great idea. That's a great idea. Luke, the lake have fish. What's feeding on the Daphnia? Um. So the lake has trout, it's stocked with trout. Um, and there is one other type of fish that I know people catch there as well, but it's mostly just trout. So it's just, in both cases, artificial populations? Yeah. Okay. I think a few survive through the winter, but mostly I think it's just artificial populations. Because people, I think, it would maybe not but people fish at the lake a lot the lake gets like a lot of visitors like on a weekend the lake can get like a thousand visitors before like noon 